Why is it that we are constantly trying to reinforce the idea of that we need to condemn the horrible, horrible people that did horrible, horrible things, but not praise, despite all the flaws that the Palestinian Authority has, a group of people that until the 80s were also deploying force, were also deploying violence, and they could call for an intifada. They could say, let's have a revolution in the West Bank as well. They absolutely could. They aren't. And no one is talking about that. Uh, this is something that the Palestinian uh, deputy ambassador to the United Nations said. Like, If the Palestinian Authority is expected and demanded to remain peaceful after 38,000 Palestinians mm-hmm. are killed, after 2.1 million Palestinians are starved, if everyone just expects that to mm-hmm. make the PLO be peaceful, then Israel should have been peaceful after October 7th. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another podcast by the Conflict Law Center. Today, we are very, very happy to be joined by Alonso Gramendi, who is a lecturer in international relations at King's College London. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you so much. It's great to be here. And I've been reading your work so much, especially since the conflict began, but but even before that as well. And I wanted to ask something in particular to an article you wrote about Palestinian statehood. So given the recent spate of countries recognizing Palestine as a state, what do you think this means for Palestinian statehood? As in, does this remain an aspiration and not reality, which Crawford very famously said in in his book in 2007? Or are we getting closer and closer to this being a reality? So, uh, look, I I have uh, great respect for the work of James Crawford. I've relied on it for many, many things throughout my career. Uh, his book on state creation is very much the book on state creation. Yeah. But I think um, I think his views on Palestine um, were uh, um, not. I, I didn't agree with them. Uh, mostly because of this idea that Palestine is an, is an aspiration. When when you look at the documents, I really don't see a reason why they should be, uh, like why why their statehood should be an aspiration and not a reality, particularly now, for example, when uh, more than 140 countries recognize Palestine at this point, it's like 70% of the world or something like that. Uh, the, the, the list of countries that recognize Israel and the list of countries that recognize Palestine is not that uh, different yeah. anymore uh, in terms of numbers. Um, and but but even even when you consider like in terms of of how many states are are recognizing each, even when you go beyond that, if you don't if that doesn't convince you, um, I still don't understand why um, the mandatory system. And this is maybe my my position that is much more minoritarian. Not a lot of people agree with me, but it's what I see in the documents. Um, I don't understand why we are so convinced that mandatory states were not states. Yeah. Like, er, mandatory Iraq had a king, um, and, and we're supposed to believe that it wasn't uh, a state subjected to mandatory limitations on, it, on, on its exercise of sovereignty. But there's no real reason, there's no real explanation in the scholarship or in the case law that says, no, actually... These mandatories were not did not have their own popular sovereignty. They they uh, because they were not colonies by definition. They were not colonies, and so mm-hmm. authors at the time had no idea what to do with this sovereignty. Um, they didn't know where it went. They they thought it was in abeyance, like this, it was sort of like in the air, like that, because they couldn't conceive that these societies, these non-Western societies, were sovereign, and they yeah. they had just placed limitations on their sovereignty. So if Iraq was a state, if Syria was a state, if we were all ready to recognize the new states of the Middle East as nation states, why is Palestine different? Why do we need to get all the way to 1988 for the Declaration of Independence to count it as a state instead of like from the moment where a mandatory system was created? And so when Crawford analyzes this whole situation, he does so from the from the perspective of Palestine is not a state and has not been a state, will we decide that it is a state at some point? Mm-hmm. And I, I, I just don't think that that's borne out in the documents. Right, yeah. And it's so interesting now when we look at that, at the language used in terms of the mandates and 
uh, the powers of tutelage that they had, you know, for those inferior uh, inferior countries, which could not really get to the point of civilization that we could consider them countries. And especially reading that now from the global south, which is like, I cannot believe that this was the accepted position back then. I I happen to agree with uh, Crawford's view still, even though pa Pakistan does recognize Palestine as a state and we refuse to recognize Israel. So the uh, Pakistani passport is not eligible for travel to Israel because it's a country we refuse to recognize. But the the reason why I can't accept Palestine as being a state, even given, even if you know we match the recognition of the countries e very equally, is because of the lack of independence. Because I don't understand how a completely occupied territory could be considered independent enough to have statehood. Right. Well, see, that's part of the interesting dynamics of how statehood works. Because we we used to have all sorts of very weird states mm -hmm. um, in the transition from the 19th century to the 20th century. Um, and that weirdness has sort of like evaporated over time because the, the, the nation state, the sovereign nation state paradigm has sort of like coalesced. Um, there's a really great book um, by Natasha Wheatley in, in the, uh, on, on the creation of states mm -hmm. that sort of explains this process and how we used to have the weirdest possible states. Austria-Hungary, for example. Hungary being like recognized by Hungarians and by Austrians as a state, but just a state that wasn't fully independent. Mm -hmm. um, so in, in the book, Natasha Whitley calls it the, the original two-state solution because it was two states in one, but the, the representation of Hungary was um, vested on the crown, you know, the Habsburg crown. And so this idea that we can have states that are not entirely uh, uh, in control of, of their own independence is um is real has existed in the past and the reason why we don't conceive it now is because of the montevideo convention and yeah. as a latin american mm -hmm. i have this like huge problem with how the montevideo convention is is discussed outside of latin america because okay. um yes the montevideo convention is important but it's not important because it defines what a state is um I, I mean, I hope it's not. Uh, I know everyone quotes it, yeah. um, but but the historically speaking, the Montevideo Convention was not a convention where where states in Latin America got together and said, "Hey, we should define what a state is." No, it was a convention where the states of Latin America met with the United States and said, "Hey, United States, you should not be able to invade us. We have a right of self determination and non intervention." Um, and that's the Montevideo Convention. The article that defines a state is sort of like there because we needed yeah. to define who is not going to be intervened. Okay. But, but this has sort of like taken a life of its own. And yeah. now it's the official absolute definition of what is a state until you start looking at uh, the Vatican. Because you need a permanent population and the Vatican doesn't have a permanent population, but the Vatican is a state. Or when you look at Taiwan, which fulfills every single requirement, but it's not a state because the one China policy. And so when you start scratching at the Montevideo Convention, you get to a point where you cannot treat it as an absolute rule book. And you need to start looking at the creation of states in sort of like a little bit more of a political uh, dynamic. And and that's where Natasha Wheatley's book comes in and, and becomes so interesting mm -hmm. because weird states are and should be possible. Yeah, right. And that's where I, I say, okay, it's occupied, but it still has international relations with a bunch of states. Um, and it, it, it has in the past even appeared in international tribunals in the 1920s. Um, so I'm not so troubled by that. Okay, okay. I think that's such an interesting perspective. And I also think uh, as every time I'm teaching statehood, I start with the Montevideo Convention and then you do what every other textbook does, which is it trips over itself to tell you that actually none of these are set in stone. So then what is the value of something where it's like, uh, even if your population leaves, even, even if you don't have to find territory, even if you don't have a government, you're still going to be a state. So like what we is I mean, such a state? We are currently discussing what happens when an island sinks into the ocean. And yeah. those yeah. people are saying, my state continues to exist. Mm. And I think they have absolute right to say, yeah, the state is not the piece of land. The state is a corporate yeah. identity, a corporate entity, sorry, that we have created. So why shouldn't it continue to exist? Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I, I'm I'm <laughs> I'm troubled by the um, the position that the Montevideo Convention has got in the discourse on international law because I think it should be famous for being the treaty that makes it illegal for the United States to occupy any mm -hmm. portion of the Americas. Mm 
it is right. illegal to mm -hmm. occupy territory in the America. But it is famous instead because it defines very badly, in my opinion, what a state is. Right, right. Okay, uh, that's a really interesting position on that. I also wanted to ask about the flip side of the right Palestinian statehood, which is the frequently argued counter to that, which is the Israeli argument that by so arguing, in some way, you are denying the right of Israel to exist, especially that chant, which is from the river to the sea. And I think it's really interesting. I was recently reading John Quigley's book. Um, and I think that for me, it's without a question that Israel had no right to exist in 1950 uh, when it was accepted as a member of the United Nations. And I think the fact that they went and lied at the United Nations about so much there. It, but now, does Israel have the right to exist? Absolutely, because it's there. Um, so what do you make of that argument? Well, I think this is because, there, I mean, the, the, there's two sides to this. One is because Israel considers itself to be the successor to the Palestinian mandate. So if, if Palestine exists, therefore Israel Mm. doesn't exist as in the only way palestine can exist if it's is if it's is if israel decides that a separate entity called palestine can exist in the course of negotiations as instead of as a state that already exists um that's one thing we can we can talk about that as as what is israel when you look at the history yeah. and the documents uh and the other one is um that uh, I think the focus should be on the self-determination of peoples, not so much on the right of states to exist or not exist. Uh, I, it's a it's a weird category um, I, to to talk about like states as if they are they die and they are born and like they have rights to exist or not exist. Um, was um, is is confederation between two countries uh, affecting the right of other states to exist? Is uh, secession affecting the right of states to exist? Um, was Czechoslovakia killed because yeah. now we have a Czech Republic and a Slovakia? It's a, it's a. I understand where it comes from, I, but I think what it's trying to channel when it when people say Israel has a right to exist is the Israeli population, the Israeli nation, has a right to self determination, and it absolutely has. Yeah. The yeah. the question is not whether it has self-determination or not. Israelis have a right to self-determination. Jewish people have a right to self-determination. Yeah. Um, the question is, how that how is that self-determination applied? And the problem continues to be that Palestinians also have a right to self-determination. So if what you want to create is a state mm -hmm. that is exclusively Jewish, and excludes those who are not Jewish, as the Israeli nation state law, a Jewish nation state law in Israel does, which says Israel is the nation state of Jews, not of non-Jewish Israelis, yeah. uh, then you are denying um, self-determination to Palestinians and to non-Jews in Israel, or at least restricting it. So it's not whether Israel has a right to exist or not, is how should Israeli self-determination be deployed and applied, and how Palestinian self-determination should be recognized as well. And this is where uh, that uh, the other component also comes in. What is Israel is also an important discussion to have. And what do you make of that discussion? I'm interested what you think about that. Right. So so a lot of um, a lot of Israeli commentators see in Israel simply the continuation of the uh, Palestinian mandate, the mandate for Palestine, uh, meaning that what remains is sort of this weird territory the west bank and gaza would be this and east jerusalem would be this weird territory that has no classification doesn't really exist which is why they claim since israel inherited the entirety of the mandate mm -hmm. the west bank and gaza is uh, is part of um of israel it's just disputed territory with the right. population that lives in there uh, which I, I i think it's not just completely wrong but completely backwards and this is something where Crawford comes back in, because Crawford didn't believe that Palestine was a state, but he uh, very clearly believed that um, when Israel was created, uh, uh, the process through which it was created was not a legal process. Like uh, Israel was not created as a result of Resolution 181 of the General Assembly, um, because the terms of that resolution were never complied with. Uh, the idea of a, a, 
of Jerusalem as a corpus separatus and like a transition period, a customs union, none of that came to be. Um, the borders of that state were not respected. Um, and so Crawford says, I cannot claim that Israel is the result of the partition plan. Israel was born through other processes. And he concludes, therefore, that since the partition plan did not create two different self-determination units in the mandate of Palestine, the mandate of Palestine continued to be the self-determination unit that had to be independent or 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 placed in trust to sheep or whatever happened to it was a single unit. What Israel did, what the Jewish agency for, for Palestine did when it declared independence and became Israel was to secede. This is not me. This is Crawford saying this, Like, mm -hmm. uh, although I agree with it. Israel seceded from the mandate of Palestine and created a separate country. And so it is the, the only reason why we're not arguing that um, Israel uh, conquered the territory of the Palestinian state is because of the way it was created, because the original borders of Israel were not the borders of the Jewish state in the partition plan. Yeah. The borders of Israel were the borders that Israel was able to control effectively after its war of independence. Okay. Right. That's um, as, as any secessionist movement. But Unlike any secessionist movement, usually what happens when a group secedes from a state or from a self-determination unit, depending on whether you believe it's a state or not, is that most states say, oh, no, no, we cannot recognize this because we believe in the permanence of borders. So when yeah. Somaliland secedes from Somalia, most states, except maybe Ethiopia now, will say, no, 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 we believe in the territorial integrity of Somalia. So Somaliland, I'm so sorry, you're still part of Somalia. Mm -hmm. And there are very specific exceptions when an entity is allowed yeah. to and, and, see. And That's just, why, yeah. Yeah, so I can insert here is, it's very interesting for me to look at it in the context of Pakistan and Bangladesh, because while there were huge uh, youth programs violations that Pakistan did in Bangladesh, it was only after we recognized Bangladesh that, that it was accepted as a member state as well. So, so there was a lot of politicking there at play as well. Sorry, carry on. Right. No, yeah, because because you don't want, uh, because of this element of international relations in the concept, the very concept of state, you don't want to tell another state, yeah. we're going to get this chunk of territory yeah. and declare independence. This is why Kosovo is so controversial, yeah. because the rules for the um, uh, partition of Yugoslavia did not account for Kosovo, which was mm -hmm. not a component member of the Federation of Yugoslavia. And so this is why Russia has complained about that for so long and, and why not every state recognizes Kosovo. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, there, there are arguments as to why it is like a, a, a specific case. Uh, but so would happen, should have happened in the case of Palestine. Palestine being the mandatory state or self-determination unit that existed in historic Palestine. And an entity inside of that uh, state secedes, conquers territory through secession, and declares, I am a separate state. Unlike any other situation mm -hmm. of secession, the United States and most states in the United Nations at the time immediately recognized, and within one or two years, it had been recognized as an independent state, which is unusual. Yeah, it, it it goes again to the Palestinian difference, the the rule of difference that Palestine is subjected to, and so Palestine has uh, its sovereignty suspended under the the mandatory terms, uh, and then under occupation, um, by an entity by a state that is the result of secession. Again, this is what Crawford says. So, if Israel is the result of secession then it cannot claim any part of territory beyond the line of effective control in 1949, the Green Line, right. which means that the West Bank, Gaza, East Jerusalem are still part of this state, this, mm -hmm. this Somalia, you would say, uh, of Palestine. And Israel, the Somaliland, cannot just claim the rest of Somalia. right? And so um, what happens here is that it is Israel claims that it is the one that has a right to uti posidetis, to, to inherit the borders of the colonial border of mandatory Palestine. Mm -hmm. I think mandatory Palestine was not a colony. It was it already had its own borders, as recognized in, in the covenant of the League of Nations. Um and and I also think that it is the one that has the right to uti posidetis. It is Palestine that has a right to the entirety of Palestine. And in 1988, what happened was what Palestinians called their historic compromise. Mm 
the Declaration of Independence of Palestine, the <laughs> second one, I guess, uh, the Declaration of Independence of Palestine was Palestine saying, okay, I'm going to stop claiming that you don't exist or cannot <laughs> exist. And I'm going to recognize certain border arrangements. Yeah. What border arrangements? Well, I'm going to renounce. They, they didn't say it in these words, but they said, I'm going to renounce my Utiposiotis right to the entirety of Palestine. And I'm going to recognize that some areas of my country you're going to get to keep. You gave the example of Pakistan. Mm. This is what's happening. The, the historic yeah. compromise of Palestine is Palestine doing what Pakistan did to Bangladesh. Yeah. And until we understand this, until we frame it in these terms, uh, it's not. It's it's all fumbled and complicated. It's so complex, you know. It's so different, unique. It's not unique. It's a regular case of secession. What's unique is that the secessionist entity has been recognized as a state for seventy five years. So, just a few points on that. If if we accept, and I, and I think it is shocking that in terms of what happened in nineteen eighty eight, and even what Hamas and Iran both accept. So the notion that they want the annihilation of an Israeli state is like they recognize it. They want a Palestinian state on twenty two percent of the original territory. That's, I mean, in any other world, everyone would accept that as a massive compromise. Um, but no, they're being asked to to not even have aspirations for a twenty uh, a state a moth eaten twenty two percent state. But I think. The, the core difference I would put between Pakistan and Bangladesh is that we very quickly within a matter of two, three years, we accepted and we recognized Bangladesh and it's now, uh, and we recognized its statehood, we had embassies and, and stuff like that. What uh, the only worry I would have with this argument of secession is could a seceding entity then be a, colon, a colonizer? Because our notion is that Israel is a settler colonial state. I mean, I think I think there's no impediment. I think okay, so I I come to settler colonialism from the perspective of uh, the theory of of modernity and coloniality, which is a Latin American theory on on decolonial studies, which essentially decouples the concept of coloniality from the concept of colonialism. Colonialism is a is a political process through which you impose, you know, the the UK colonizing India or and Pakistan or or uh, Spain colonizing Peru. Um, that's colonization. Coloniality is a set of relations uh, that that are premised on domination, based on the idea that there is a paradigm, a superior paradigm called European modernity, enlightenment, call it what you will. Um, and that those who do not conform to that paradigm are inferior. This is what Edward Said talked about when he discussed, you know, Orientalism. Yeah. Uh, so um, Latin Americans and Arabs, uh, especially Palestinians, are subjected to this modernity standard, to this Orientalism, if you will. And so if, uh, if you frame the history of Israel in terms of those relations, we tend to just automatically conceive the secessionist entity as the informal little guy. Right. That doesn't need to be the case. Yeah. Secession is just a legal term that we have invented to describe situations. When you look at it in history, when you tie it to the history of Zionism, to the history of the colonization and ethnic cleansing of Palestine, Israel is just the denouement of a much longer process, which was colonial in nature. Not just because it effectively is trying to colonize the West Bank right now, uh, but because the relationships that it has established between the children of light, to quote the Prime Minister of Israel, uh, and the children of darkness is colonial in nature. So I don't think there's any impediment to to saying that a, a, an entity that secedes from another is colonialist. Like I would, yeah. I would argue, for example, the the Confederate States of America seceding from the United States right. were still acting absolutely colonially. Yeah. These are the indigenous populations of the United States and enslaved African Americans. Yeah, yeah, and it's so interesting to me when I try and put my shoes into delegates at the UN in the night in nineteen forty eight to nineteen fifty. I I would be so sympathetic to a Jewish desire for their own state uh, because I think just being I, I know that a lot of people on the critical left wing of international law they really do decry the nation state but i'm i'm a proper nationalist i totally agree with it and i also agree with the, uh, the the strong jewish desire for one um and so so zionism to me is not is not 
the way it has become something which is so horrifying in effect I understand that at, when it was at its budding idea it was a great one and it was something that is very uh is is very reminiscent of what we had here in the Indian subcontinent as well in terms of nationalism running out but that it was European guilt which was pushed on to everybody else that nobody else felt compared to them to be so sympathetic to this because I don't think even at that time that they, they had a full cognizance of what happened in World War II compared to the compared to Europe and how it had that. But now it's so interesting because it's Palestinian nationalism, which everyone can understand so greatly and which we empathize with so much. And I I wanted to ask you a bit about that in terms of the the narrative about Hamas and the West is so heavily propagandized about this stuff. And I wonder whether your perspective is a bit different because you come from Peru, but yet you work in the global north. So here the conversations are so different from the conversations that I hear over there. And the notion of we have such little awareness of what the right to resistance means in international law, really, as like a tangible right and what it entails. But also the notion of the commission of egregious and horrible war crimes on October 7th. So the whole question, do you condemn Hamas? It's not even a question, of course, we condemn Hamas and war crimes generally. But does that put you out of the running entirely of being a representative for the Palestinian people and of being a national liberation movement? Yeah, I just want to start before I get into that. So remind me if I get sidetracked for too long. Before I get into that, I want to address that thing of um, uh, the cry in the state. Uh, because sure, uh, there is a there's an argument for that uh, that the state is necessary, but I, I think my my concern, my main concern, is not necessarily the idea that there needs to be something called a state, but the idea that that state needs to look like a Westphalian nation state, meaning that it is uh, France for the French, England for the English, and um, you know Germany for the Germans, mm. uh, and that there is such a thing as a unique single nation. That needs to be protected by the state, um, because that's where Zionism comes from. Is the idea that uh, there needs to be a Jewish state for Jewish people, mm -hmm. right? And the problem is that in the construction of nationalisms, the construction of nations, uh, take Peru for example, um, we have constructed a nation called the Peruvian nation. That nation is defined as the mix, the miscegenation of Spanish and indigenous Quechua, uh, Aymara, and you know, indigenous populations of the Andes. That is the definition. It's to the point where in Peru, many people say that we are post-racism because everyone is so mixed that, you know, there's no races. This is a post-racial state, which is, of course, a lie. Mm -hmm. um, but because this nation is defined as the Peruvian nation, is defined as the, the mix of indigenous and Spanish, if you define yourself as indigenous, uh, you are sort of excluded from the concept of that nation. And so indigenous people in Peru live in a colonial relation with the rest of the country. So right. if, if they are living on top of very valuable resources that the Peruvian nation needs, mm -hmm. uh, they're an obstacle for them. They're not part of, they're Peruvian, but they're not part of the nation. They need to be put aside, move away, because like we need it for the nation. Mm -hmm. That's the problem. Uh, that's the problem with nationalism, the nationhood and nationalism uh, combined into this idea of the Westphalian state, which is mm -hmm. what happens with Israel, right? This this idea that you cannot be part, fully part of the Jewish nation if you're Palestinian, because it, it, it's it's a weird thing about Israel that it has a citizenship law where yeah. citizens can be Israeli, but they don't have a Israeli nationality within Israel. People can be classified as either Arab Israeli or Jewish yeah. Israeli. Uh, so the nation, this is the point of the nation state law in Israel, is Jewish. Yeah. That's the the yeah. crux of the problem. So I mean, if you were to create a different Palestinians itself to call them Israeli Arabs. So you can be Arab and Israeli. I mean, you're not going to be fully Israeli, but but it's an erasure of Palestine itself to call them Israeli Arabs. Yeah. Yeah, and there is a big uh, a problem with allocation of rights for, for this population because uh, the land is supposed to be settled by Jews, right? So uh, land is not very equally distributed. Yeah. Um, so I, I, would, I would just push back a little bit and say the problem is the kind of state that we have promoted as the, as the most important actor in international relations um, in Latin America. Yeah. Just to go down that thread a little bit more, 
so my my counter to that is that the the modern states that we did fight for find they were based on a Westphalian model, which is a problem. Um, they were so hard fought for, and modern people felt, I mean, people were talking about when they went to newly independent Ghana and people there were like very Ghanaian and it was so new and it was it was like a modern state but they felt it as part of their identity and I was having this talk with my students as well and they were like what does being Pakistani come down to and one of them quit that is basically a kind of chip a uh, pack of chips that you get here that you don't get anywhere else it's just having that <laughs> because we couldn't properly you know fundamentally distill what being Pakistani came down to but I wonder then what is the uh, what is better than the nation state then? Well, in Latin America, I, I would say that depends on each region. Okay, I don't want to speak for every single country on earth, but at least in Latin America, what indigenous communities are pushing for is a recognition that our states are not really nation states. Many states are not really nation states. Look at Belgium. Belgium has Walloons and Flemish. Mm. There's no you know, Belgian nation. And yet it is recognized as the Belgian nation. Like, yeah. it would be absurd for me to say that there's no such thing as a Belgian national. Um, they're just Walloon and Flemish. Mm -hmm. So part of the recognition is that this idea that Belgium is a nation state is sort of not true. They're, they're, they have more than one nation. They just have defined their nationhood as complex. And this is sort of what we're trying to do in Latin America, where there's a lot of movements, indigenous movements, to reclassify the state and reorganize the state constitutionally as plurinational states, meaning that you recognize that the idea of the Peruvian or Bolivian or Ecuadorian nation that exists is complex, cannot be defined through simplistic terms like, oh, the mix of Spanish and indigenous. And so those nations... Um, such as the um, the Quechuas and the Aymaras in Peru, cannot be seen as minorities. The idea of a minority is problematic. Okay. So they need to be incorporated into the into the into the community and form part of a plurinational state with adequate representation, with rights over resources, with like equal terms. Mm -hmm. uh, and we see this in in more than just Latin America. Um, there's a lot of problems right now in India because India wants to define itself, wants to define the Indian nation as Hindu, yeah. not Muslim. Yeah. That's the same phenomenon. You're defining the nation in terms of one nation for one state, India for the Hindus. Whereas most post-colonial states, and I would argue most states, look at the United Kingdom with Scotland, Wales, and Northern Ireland, in addition to England. Most states in the world are not that simple. So yeah. just the acknowledgement that states are not one nation for one state is already revolutionary. And this is something that Palestinian scholars have defended themselves for a very long time, the so-called one state solution, right? Uh, where there would be a, a Israel slash Palestine would be the national home for Palestinians and for, for, for um, uh, Jewish Palestinians and Arab Palestinians and uh, or Jewish Israelis and Arab Israelis um, in a in a in a single nation that is democratic that recognizes that no one can be oppressed by the other. You, know, you, you no one should be on top. Everyone yeah. should coexist. Everyone should have their rights recognized. And you can absolutely create a national home for Jewish people in a democratic state. Right. You don't need to choose. In the mm -hmm. same way as the national home of Walloons is Belgium. It's not the state of Wallonia. And you don't need to create the state of Wallonia to protect the rights of Walloons or Flemish. So it's it's sort of like that recognition of making states more complex. Going back to the times when states more, were more complex, we've simplified, dumped down the concept of a state because of nationalism. And nationalism only gets you to this point where it says, this is mine, not yours. This is for the Hindus. This is Bharat, not India. Uh, this is uh, Peru is post-racist. So why are you defining yourself as indigenous? Just acculturate, assimilate, and and abandon your backward ways. This is all a legacy of colonialism. Mm -hmm. And uh, the more we recognize it, recognize it, and and fight against it, the more equal and the, uh, the society will be, and the more self-determination that thing that we say is so crucial for both Israelis and Palestinians, yeah, and Jewish people and Arabs is going to be respected. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, so are you in favor of a one state solution? 
So it's very tricky for me as a Latin American to say, oh, this is what I think you guys should do. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, but yes, my, my personal solution as someone who's not trying to solve the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, but uh, is just has a, a a very defined way of understanding what is a state and what what problems statehood brings. If I apply the same set of rules that I apply for Peru, meaning I want Peru to be a plurinational state um, where there's no such thing as a minority um, and everyone is entitled to the same level of self-determination in a more complex notion of, of uh, nationhood, then yes, the logical conclusion for me would be that the best solution is to have a one-state, what, what is called a one-state solution. Mm -hmm. I would call it more like an anti-colonial concept of state or, or not a nation state, but yeah, it would be a one-state solution. Now, it's not really for me to tell Palestinians and Israelis how they solve their conflict, uh, but if they ask me, I would say down with states, they all states suck. <laughs> Um, okay, maybe we can agree to that, but I really like your argument of many nations in one state, but all of them are respected. And I think it's, it's interesting that so many Palestinians have come out and said a two-state solution means nothing. It means that you're never going to allow there to be a Palestinian state because that's what Israel has repeatedly said that it doesn't want and it won't allow it to happen. The concept of a state cannot be decoupled from the history of international law, and the history of international law is a history of colonialism. Mm -hmm. International law exists to operationalize colonization. It, it it started all the way back with Spanish colonization, and it's professionalized and 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 you know uh, institutionalized with um, the colonization of Africa. That's where it comes from. It it's yeah. it's, it's inseparable. So when you talk about a two state solution, um, premised on the concept of international law. International law demands certain conditions for statehood, usually revolving around the war on terrorism or global capitalism or you name it. Um, and so when you look at the peace plans, what is offered for Palestinian statehood, it is inseparable from the Orientalist tropes that exist in the region. So you will have a demilitarized Palestinian state because yeah. all Palestinians are terrorists. Yeah. You will not have a right of return because Israel has a right to exist. And therefore, if, mm -hmm. you, if you establish democracy in Israel, all of a sudden, that's bad, um, and and uh, and security over Palestine will be led by Israel. So you will not really be creating a state, just like Oslo, just like the Oslo peace process. You will be creating an entity that you will give a name. In this case, the Palestinian Authority. In the two-state solution, the Palestinian state, which mm -hmm. will not be independent, will not have its own state. It will depend on Israel to decide when the conditions have been met for. Independence. So it's another sacred trust of civilization, another Palestinian mandate, only instead of the British, it'll be the Israelis. And that just doesn't work. That's why when, when people say, oh, Palestine can only come into existence as in the course of negotiations, mm -hmm. it, that doesn't work. No. Statehood comes first, negotiations come, come second. That's, that's what I believe. That's the only way of having two equal states. Yeah. I agree with you. And I think the fact that you haven't had negotiations in decades. So when they're talking about negotiations, I'm like, what negotiations are you even talking about? But but going yeah. to the point that you made about the global south and about how international itself has a colonial legacy. Now we had decolonization and now we have all of these uh, states in the global south. What do you think that their role is going to be? And I really think that even, I mean, looking at it from a Pakistani perspective, the conversation here has changed so much in light of you had the Russo-Ukrainian conflict and the attitude of the West, it was so different. You have this Israeli-Palestinian conflict and it's something that the global South cares about so much. And we've seen these uh, cases being taken to the ICJ by South Africa and by Nicaragua. And it's really, I think it goes back to something that international was kind of made for us. So it was made by the rule makers are the people who used to make international to beat us up with and now we're like, hey, we're going to beat you up with it as well. But what do you think we're going to have be able to have an impact on in terms of norms of international going forward? Especially yeah. So the, to the right to resistance, because I'm very interested in that. Yeah. I was going to I was going to tie it up to your previous question mm -hmm. on, on, you know, how yeah. how we explore this issue in the global south as opposed to in the global north. Um, which is true. Like I come from a country that recognizes Palestinian statehood uh, and where uh, there's a lot of political involvement in in, in the issue of Israel-Palestine. And um, 
even even though it's very far away, uh, I think Palestinian solidarity is uh, very current in in you know left wing politics in Peru, um, and um, I think it is interesting because at least in Latin America, there's like uh, it's almost like two societies. There's one group of elite people that all have like European ancestry that are very much aligned to the United States, and then there's <laughs> the people that are able to recognize a colonial relation when they see one. Right. Um, yeah. Surprise, surprise, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I do think that um, you were talking about uh, the right of resistance. Uh, I, I do think it is important to make a distinction um, because I see often um, I see often signs like when, whenever I go to demonstrations or anything or, or, or whenever I talk to, to friends and, and people, um, there's one phrase that that pops up sometimes, and it's like by any available, but, but sorry, um, through through any means possible, yeah, right, uh, through any means necessary, um, that liberation needs to be achieved through any means necessary, and that is a that is a phrase that I understand where it comes from, but I think it is important to contextualize it in the in 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 in, in historical terms uh, as as, um, because if we we do need to uh come to the issue of resistance from a notion of um, fundamental human rights. And uh, I do not believe that any means necessary is a, is a, is a good argument for uh, the exercise of political violence, any kind of political yeah. violence, war, resistance, uh, um, civil war, anything. Like I, uh, part of my research is on uh, how the the concept of military necessity has been weaponized to mm -hmm. justify anything. Like international humanitarian law right now justifies any act. Like Lieber himself, the yeah. so-called father of international humanitarian law, believed in sort of like the more terrible you can make a war, the faster it'll be. So that's good. So yeah. humanity is well served, right? And I fundamentally disagree with that view. And I disagree with that view if it's a state deploying it or if it's a resistance movement deploying it. Even if I fundamentally agree with the right of resistance by colonized and oppressed and dominated peoples, the phrasing that the United Nations General Assembly agreed to exists for a reason. And the framing is not by any means necessary because we accept that there's such a thing as human rights, there's such a thing as humanitarian obligations, uh, and there's such a thing as a non-combatant. Even Fanon himself, you know, who, who famous, famously defended anti-colonial violence, said that anti-colonial violence for the sake of anti-colonial violence like he, yes. he used the phrase just looking for a settler to shoot mm -hmm. is not productive yeah of course i i would say it's immoral as well but like he would say like it's not productive because mm -hmm. then you end up with a movement that will be traumatized he he was very interested in the psychology of resistance and how can you create uh judith butler says for example how can you create a peaceful country out of a violent revolution i don't go as far as as they go mm -hmm. um but the framing of the UN General Assembly is important because it says through all available means and war crimes, crimes against humanity, uh, torture, you know, uh, um, those are genocide. Those are not available yeah. as a means of resistance. So you can have Indeed. you can have a resistance movement just within the bounds that we have established for international law in the realm of decolonization because otherwise we, we justify this like unnecessary in the legal term descent into um a free-for-all yeah. and one should not become what it's trying to destroy and mm -hmm. if we're trying to destroy the oppression of the vulnerable and the oppression of the defenseless um then one should not then deploy those same weapons against civilians. So, for example, I do not understand how uh, killing young people in a rave in Israel Completely. advances Palestinian decolonization. Yes. It just doesn't. Yeah. I can absolutely see why destroying a border fence or launching an attack, or mm -hmm. I can see how that is... Uh, included within the all of it, uh, the uh, all available means, but then if you're going to go beyond military targets and start attacking civilians, then that's not available. That's immoral, and it yeah. should be condemned. Yeah, and I and I think it's 
Um, it's quite frustrating to see Piers Morgan keep on ask, asking the question. And I'm like, it is a simple question. Don't side the it, just say yes. It's not right to go and hunt down grandmothers in the kibbutz scene. Um, and I think I, I read it in Adam Schatz's London Review of Books article immediately after October 7th. And it was such a clear eyed approach because he said the first phase of Alexa floods where you went after the IDF, that's fine. The minute you went out into the raid, the minute you went out into the kibbutz scene, that's, I mean, it's unquestionable for us as a war crime. But do you think uh, that, that question has been conflated with, I'm not even seeing arguments right now that strongly that even in line with international law, you are allowed to use resistance in the form of armed struggle against the idea in a way that complies with it, the laws. Well, I think that's because of uh, the very obvious chilling factor that exists right now mm -hmm. when discussing Palestine. People can't even wear a Palestinian flag pin yeah. without being accused of terrorists. So it is a very tricky subject to discuss. Mm -hmm. uh, I will be honest and say uh, my mind is going at a thousand miles an hour right now because I want to make sure that I'm very clear with what I'm saying because I know mm -hmm. that there's a lot of people out there that I will be looking to misconstrue what I'm saying as a defense of terrorism. Uh, and yeah. I mean, I'm Peruvian. <laughs> I I grew up in a country attacked by terrorism. I would not. I do not condone the attack on uh, attacks on civilians. Yeah. Uh, I have family members that were affected by terrorism. I would not do that. But I know that uh, if you start talking about this in any in any kind of academic term, uh, it it will be misconstrued by bad faith actors, uh, and that is part of what's stifling the the mm. the conversation. Um, I think um, I think it is it is interesting as well. You, you mentioned this this question: Do you condemn October seventh? And yes, it is very easy to say yes, I do. But then at, at the same time, um, we are not uh, people are not asked to condemn any Israeli attack, any Israeli colonization of Palestine, mm -hmm. and so it becomes frustrating uh, because it is clearly a double standard. And yes, it is easy to just say yes, I condemn it. Like I, I, I think, uh, um, I, I think the name is escaping me, but I think this Egyptian comedian Basim Youssef, I think it's his name. Uh, I think he had the right approach. Like, just yeah, I do. Yeah. I, let's move on. Um, and um, sort of downplay that uh, requirement of condemning a little bit. Uh, while condemning it, because there's a there's a there's another set of Palestinians uh, involved in this conflict that have been like mind blowingly admirable in how they have responded to uh, what happened after October seventh. Mm. Because you, on the one hand, you have Hamas, and and I know many bad faith actors really try to make Hamas the representative of Palestinians when it isn't. Um, but you have the Palestinian Authority and the OL, the um, um, PLO, sorry, um, involved in this as well as representatives of the Palestinian people, and thirty eight thousand of their citizens yeah. have been um, killed, and so yet terribly low opinion of the PA as you know occupation by oh. Palestinians of Palestinians for the occupier. And I, I do wonder whether they're the ones who are the happiest right now that Hamas is facing such a defeat. Uh, but but the, I, the question I grapple with is the notion that Hamas does not represent the Palestinian people, even the most recent polls have shown such huge um, support for Hamas that I'm like, I don't know whether that's the question, but I, I think the they may well represent the Palestinian people and they still should not be collectively punished for what Hamas is doing. Oh, sure, sure. Um, I mean, there is a world where, you know, Hamas uh, um, accepts the, the Geneva Conventions and uh, assumes uh, a role as a, a formerly national yeah. liberation movement and then, yeah, starts to represent uh, Palestine as a... As a, as a you know, as formally, let's say under under the law, because right now it's all very mushy, very murky as what is the yeah. status of, of of Hamas within Palestinian resistance. Um, there's different opinions uh, as to whether um, that's why there's so many positions about whether it's a non-international conflict or an international conflict, yada yada yada. Uh, mm -hmm. But there is a world where that happens, that that still doesn't justify um, what Israel is doing. What, what what I was going for was 
why is it that we are constantly trying to reinforce the idea of that we need to condemn the horrible, horrible people um, that did horrible, horrible things, um, but not praise, uh, despite all the flaws that the Palestinian Authority has, a group of people that until the 80s were also um, deploying force, were also deploying violence, and they could call for an intifada. They could uh, mm. say, let's have a revolution in the West Bank as well. They absolutely could. They aren't. And no one is talking about that. Uh, this is something that the Palestinian uh, deputy ambassador to the United Nations said. Like, If um, if Palestine, is, if the Palestinian Authority is expected and demanded to remain peaceful after 38,000 Palestinians mm -hmm. are killed, after 2.1 million Palestinians are starved, if everyone just expects that to mm -hmm. make the PLO be peaceful, then Israel should have been peaceful after October 7th. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And, and I think that's such a powerful argument. Yeah. Because it robs the strength away from uh, let's only discuss Hamas. And now let's look at the other side of the equation. And yes, the PLO and the Palestinian Authority have many flaws. So it's but... the point that I, I'm I'm like Mahmoud Abbas, the, the reason why Hamas is so popular as well, and I'm shocked, I'm, I, I can't imagine that you would lose 38,000 people in such a small part of territory, be constantly bombarded, and then still support the group that, and not a portion blame to them for getting you there. But the reason why Hamas is so proud of itself for what it's achieved even up to this is that they managed to get boots off the ground in Gaza. So they often say that you can go and walk up to Mahmoud Abbas's house and arrest him. The Israelis can't set foot in Gaza because we've made sure and now we know. And I don't know if you read the, the recent report by Jeremy Scahill where he went and, and spoke to some Hamas members, but the, it, it seems to have reinforced to them that armed struggle is the only thing that works because of the PA. Um, and I and because of what the PA have done. And so Hamas is... Uh, even in the West Bank, their support skyrocketed, which which I was very surprised by. But I think if you've been following uh, Palestinian politics for longer than I have, you wouldn't be that surprised by it. So I, I feel like there is always that elite which kind of interacts and uh, makes money off the occupation of their own people. And I think that is really what the PA is doing. So when they go and cry their crocodile tears at the UN, I don't, I'm not buying it, really. I think, I think there is a... Um... Um, a structural problem here that is called the Oslo Accords. Um, because what what they did was they normalized mm -hmm. the occupation. They yeah. they gave it a. a I, I think I, I may be wrong, but I think even Edward Said uh, wrote a letter to the Palestinian Authority and said, "Do not sign this," <laughs> um, because yeah. it will it will normalize. And this is this is what this is my problem with the proposed two state solution. It will further normalize the occupation. It will not end it mm -hmm. um, because the, the Palestinian state will not be independent from day one. It will be um, subjected to the security control of Israel. Israel mm -hmm. will decide when mm -hmm. Palestine is civilized enough to be independent, quote unquote, civilized. Of yeah. Course. yeah. Um, and so the Palestinian Authority, I, I think it's, it's acting within the bounds of that decision that it made so many years ago. Um, and is trying to stick to it. Um, I, I do find, uh, I do find value in sticking to peaceful resolution. Um, I find value in that. I completely understand those who say, no, no, we need to, we need to do something else. We need to do, we need to recur to violence. I understand that, um, but I think there is value in peaceful. Engagement now could could the Palestinian Authority be doing other things? Uh, yes, I think the fact that um, uh, you were talking about the South Africa case, uh, that mm -hmm. South Africa has opened up this um, this case for um, against Israel will open up avenues for the Palestinian Authority to start doing those things that it could do. Yeah. Um, because when you're dealing with a country that shoots people for walking too close to a fence yeah. it is difficult to organize a domestic resistance movement mm -hmm. especially if you have this commitment to peaceful resistance not armed resistance yeah. right? so 
for the Palestinian Authority, it's very difficult to say, okay, let's all march to the you know, central of Jerusalem and mm -hmm. stage a demonstration. They will be shot. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. So um, it is very difficult to organize peaceful resistance. And this is where the role of the global south is so important. Palestinian solidarity is so important because no wonder Palestinians are frustrated with the Palestinian Authority. It's yeah. been years and nothing's happened. Yeah. All that's happened is that the, the peace process has stalled and uh, the occupation has been normalized to the point where the UK is now arguing at the ICC that that normalization of the occupation means that the ICC case needs to end, right. which is mind-blowing, right? It's a yeah, mind-blowing argument. Yeah. But, but that's at some point, that decision of abandoning armed struggle and going into peaceful resistance needed help. Mm -hmm. Palestine used to have a lot more help from yeah. Arabic countries. And those countries have now normalized relations with, or are or are normalizing and trying to normalize yeah. relations with Israel. So the fact that South Africa is um, resurrecting that sort of like solidarity in the global South for Palestine is so important because Palestinians can't do this alone. Yes. Like yeah. decolonization was not something that happened in the 60s in specific places isolated from one another. Right. Cuba sent troops to Angola for crying out loud. Mm -hmm. So this solidarity is very important. And we are at a moment in time where the global south is able to do things that it wasn't able to do a few years back. I still remember when, when Belgium passed its universal jurisdiction law at the end of the 90s, and they indicted Donald Rumsfeld for crimes against humanity. Mm -hmm. And literally, the United States, a Bush picked up the phone, called uh, Belgium and said, hey, Belgium, if you want to keep being NATO's headquarters, you better remove this law from, mm -hmm. from the books. And right. they did. Yeah. So imagine what South Africa could do in 2000. Nothing. Mm -hmm. right? But now, as world order is starting to change and, and uh, the global south is more self-reliant and more independent, there is a lot of push for the global south to intervene in this way in ways that were not possible before. And uh, the United States cannot pick up the phone and say, hey, South Africa, uh, abandon that case right yeah. now. Yeah. It doesn't work. And that's why it's so important for me that we start creating spaces in mm -hmm. world order, in international relations, for countries that don't want to be the new hegemon. As in Russia and China, they want to be the new hegemon. Meaning by that, they want to be powerful enough to bend the rules. That's what they want to do. Just like the United States, just like NATO, they want to bend the rules as well. It's my time. China especially is like center of humiliation. Now it's my my turn, my time to shine. But Brazil, South Africa, um, and I would argue a bunch of other states, uh, Slovenia, for example, they are states that are going against the predominant uh, world order in ways that cannot be stopped by a phone call, Yeah. Um, but that are not meant to bend the existing rules, but to mm -hmm. enforce them. And that is something that we have not seen before in this, mm -hmm. you know, very hopeless world order that we have since the 19th century. Um, and I'm hoping that it can become a thing to be a rule enforcer to use your political power to enforce rules which is why i was so happy when south africa despite its wobbling on the matter ultimately did not invite putin to come to south africa because they said if you come i'll need to arrest you yes there's double standards yes there's politics involved mm -hmm. but at the end of the day when the chips were down south africa did not invite putin to south africa and that matters yeah so hopefully we will see more of these like Brazil, Slovenia, um, uh, South Africa, um, and, and hopefully countries, you know, with, with more political power as well in, in the centers of power, like Spain or Ireland, um, to create this like group of enforcers. Yeah. That would be revolutionary. Yeah, I completely agree. And that is such a nice note to end it on. Is that, <laughs> I wanted to say so much more, but we've already been going an hour. So I don't want to no, take more of your time. Thank you so much for talking to us. No, thank you for having me. This was extremely fun and very informative. So um, if you want to do it again, I'm all, all for yeah, it. Yeah, <laughs> sure, definitely. And thank you to everyone so much for watching at home.